This program is offered as a partnership between the Ann Arbor District Library and the Ann Arbor Art Center. My name is Peyton Cook and I teach these Sunday drawing classes at the library. Unfortunately, we're not able to meet in person right now, so for now we are just doing these online videos. So as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about abstract art today. So abstract art is a rather vague term for any work of art that the primary art aim is not to portray a recognizable scene or object versus non-objective art, which is referring to, um, refers more specifically to works of art that are not based on anything within the um, observable world. So here are some examples, one by Jackson Pollock, another by George Brock, of what the difference between non-objective art and abstract art looks like. So I want to consider the history here of, you know, where we've been with abstract art and where we are now, basically, with contemporary art. So I'm just going to take uh, several minutes here to look at the timeline, starting with William Turner. So William Turner, with his artwork, we see a lot of different styles, honestly. Um, and so we start like his earlier work here um, was more traditional and um, in watercolor with backdrops of brilliantly colored skies um, versus his later works, which are incredible compositions of swirling color and light. So his painting really came to be about movement and masses of color that were often non-representational. So we're going to continue to talk about abstract art, and um, we'll talk about several different artists that really identified as an abstract artist versus William Turner, who, though we consider to be the first kind of real abstraction in art, um, it's not necessarily completely abstract. So we'll look at some major works of art that were abstract, as well as some key concepts about abstract art. So Kandinsky is really the first artist that created a totally abstract image. He was the co-founder of the Blue Rider group during the Expressionist movement in 1912. He emphasized the relationship between color and form, and painting was a very spiritual process for Kandinsky. Um, he, it said that he had synesthesia, which means that um, he had kind of this union of the senses, so he would often listen to music and he would see colors and forms. So cubism is the next real example of, um, you know, the, the, the first style of abstract art that um, evolved at the beginning of the 20th century. And this was in response to a world that was changing with unprecedented speed. So George Brock and Pablo Picasso are the artists that really developed this. And so you see a whole movement that, that took place that is, you know, abstract art. So George Brock was first actually a Fauvist artist. And if you're not familiar with Fauvism, um, that would be artists like Henry Matisse, for example, Andre Durain. Um, and once he visited Pablo Picasso's studio, uh, he became friends with Picasso, and then they ex started exchanging ideas and techniques regarding cubism. So in this piece here, these pieces here, we see a lot of similarities, even though one piece is by Picasso here on the left, and the other one on the right is by George Brock. Both of these pieces are, have a nearly monochromatic palette, extreme flattening of visual space, linear grid-like surface and highlighting and shading on each section. In several writers at the time, they wrote about the Cubist style and they argued that these artists were actually giving the viewers more information about the subject matter, even though it was abstract, rather than less. Reason being, they were providing the viewers with a more composite view as compared to a single vantage point in perspective. So the next movement I want to talk about is an art movement called suprematism. And Cal Kazimir Malevich started this movement, and he named the movement suprematism because he believed it, was, it would be superior to all the movements in the past and that it would lead to supremacy of pure feeling or perception in the pictorial arts. He desired to make associations between the language of words and the language of art, and he also wanted to defy reason in art. 
So in this piece on the left, um, you know, he was familiar with the Cubist art movement. He had access to seeing Cubism. So you can really see a lot of Cubist influence here on this piece, specifically the synthetic style of Cubism. Um, he's using a real postage stamp here and thermometer incorporated into this piece. And this one on the right here is this whole exhibition and it was titled that because he felt he had reached ground zero. Now, I think this is a really interesting set of pieces here. Um, the two on the left are, or, or I should say the one on the left and the center one are both by Malevich, whereas the one on the right is by Piet Mondrian. Now, um, the one with the black square, um, the shape itself dictates the composition so that there's really not a composition. Um, you know, he was really interested in geometry and um, so obvious emphasis on that shape there, and it's really hard to tell in this image, but there was a little bit of interest there on the surface texture, so you, um, it's hard to see, but there is a little texture there. And uh, with the one in the center, he, you know, he felt that he wanted to free art from the burden of representation, and um, that this had a realness to it. So the one on the right here by Mondrian, um, you know, he, his whole style is this idea of neoplasticism, and he created all of these different series of uh, similar works that had a grid-like composition with primary colors. So the next movement I want to talk about is abstract expressionism, which we actually talked about this just a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was an art movement by a group of painters in New York, and these artists did not try to make images of things as they were in the real world. So they would make large-scale works as a reflection of their psyches. They were influenced by surrealism. Um, they had their own exhibit called New American Painting um, that exhibited solely the works of the abstract expressionists. And um, prior to this, the curators were not convinced that the audience would take to this type of art at the museum in the 90s. 1940s. So Jackson Pollock um, is an or was an abstract expressionist, and he was greatly influenced by artists such as Picasso, Miro, Rivera, and he was also influenced by his wife, Lee Krasner, who was another abstract expressionist. Um, he suffered from a lot of anxiety and depression, and um, but he was a really successful artist, and he really put the idea of the action painting into play. We see the um, a lot of movement in his art as he would just fling paint across the page. And he uh, departed from the idea of using a brush to paint. So he wouldn't just be limited to a brush. He would use a lot of different tools to create the marks on the page or the canvas. Uh, Willem de Kooning is another abstract expressionist. Um, I think the abstract expressionist movement in general is just a really key movement when considering abstract art. And, um, but anyway, Kooning was a commercial design artist and decorator. Um, in 1935, he received funding from the Works Progress Administration and he created several murals and other works. Um, because he was uh, from the Netherlands and not a U.S. citizen, eventually he did lose funding, um, though at some point he gained citizenship. And he's known for his paintings of women. One of his models, Elaine, would become his wife later, and um, she was also an artist. Franz Klein is known for his sense of gesture in his paintings, and he's also known for primarily painting with black paint on a white background. Um, later, at some point, too, he would bring in some use of color. Scale was also really important, so they were really large-scale works of art, and he really desired to depart from the elegance of European art. His compositions could be influenced by industry. Some of it looks similar to railroad tracks or bridges. Mark Rothko um, is also an abstract expressionist. Even though the other artists were more of an action painter, um, painters 
his art would really have more of the absence of action. So he would use several thin washes of colors uh, layered on top of each other to develop a more rich color. So he wanted the viewers to feel the solitary, introspective qualities that he felt while painting. And so his paintings were quite large. He wanted them to be hung so that the viewers could face them head on as if they could walk right into it. So he wanted to provide a universe for the viewers that they didn't have in the real world. Here's a quote by Jackson Pollock. Abstract painting is abstract. It confronts you. There was a reviewer a while back who wrote that my pictures didn't have any beginning or any end. He didn't mean it as a compliment, but it was. I just really like that. I think that's a really fun way to kind of close the abstract expressionist and move forward. So now that we've looked through all of these different artists throughout history, we now can think about it and say, okay, now what? Right? So what does that leave us with? So we have to understand and accept some key points in order to understand further. So some of these points are, what is the context? The artist's reasoning or concept? Where does it take you? How do your own experiences shape your response or reaction? And art is an experience. It doesn't always have to be explained in words. So these are just things to keep in mind as you have an open mind looking at uh, some contemporary artworks, okay? Now, when you're looking at these, you might think, hmm, but it looks like my dog might be able to do that, right? Um, I've certainly heard that, or maybe you're a preschooler or whatever. <laughs> Fair statements to make in some ways, um, at least as far as a question goes. And while your fur child may be very talented, we must consider things such as these. So, does my dog understand balance and composition? What about color methods and other formal qualities? Is my pup able to derive meaning from his or her art? mark making? And is my canine capable of challenging the public's perception of what is considered art? So this takes these ideas that I mentioned before about the context, the artist's reasoning or concept. Where does it take you personally? How do your own experiences shape that response or reaction? And just the idea of art being an experience. These are things that already kind of lead us to think that hmm, might be a little bit more complicated than just something that my dog could step and paint and walk all over canvas and call it abstract art, right? So this takes it a step further and we start thinking about the formal elements of art and balance and composition and principles of design and so many other things that really go into the making. And this can be a challenging thing. When thinking about abstract art, it's not so black and white. It's not crystal clear. So we have to really look at all these different things in order to consider them. So the pieces that I want us to look at today are just a complete variety. And when we're looking at these, just ask yourself some of these questions. If these are a lot of different questions to think about. Um, if it's too many, just focus on color, right? Think about line, think about shape and value and other elements of art such as those. Maybe think about just simply your response, right? How do you respond? How do you feel, right? And sometimes, especially when it's something that is unfamiliar and unusual, it can be a challenge, I think, to be really open-minded sometimes to how you might feel, how you might respond to a work of art. So I challenge you today to challenge yourself and see what kind of response you have. Even if you don't feel like you respond to certain ones, that's okay. That's a response that you don't respond. Um, there might be others that you actually respond um, uh, quite a bit to. So let's take a look at some contemporary abstract artworks. And some of these artists I'm more familiar with than others, so I may elaborate on some pieces more so than um, some other pieces. But again, here we see this painting is um, was done in 1949, and uh, so this was right around the time of a lot of these other artists that we talked about today. 
and we can see how, um, you know, maybe you see something, right? So what do you see when you look at this work of art, right? How is the composition? Is it balanced? Is it unbalanced? Sometimes something might be unbalanced intentionally. And if that's the case, why? This is one of my favorite artists of all time, Anselm Kiefer, and I encourage you to look up different, um, some other examples of his artwork. Um, but I just really love the sense of space that this artist creates. And for me, it just, all of his works pretty much just completely pull me into this space. And they're really large works typically. And um, there's so much texture. I'm a big fan of texture and art. So it's another reason why I'm really attracted to um, these works. This one I'm really interested in the application of the paint. I wouldn't say overall I um, feel like it's a different kind of space, right? And so this is almost more similar to the uh, piece by Mondrian, for example, the, with the, the lines and the colors and, um, and just the application of paint. This is another great contemporary artist that I would encourage you to look up. Um, he was a German-born visual artist, and um, Richter has produced abstract art as well as photorealistic paintings and also photographs and glasswork. He is widely regarded as one of the most important contemporary German artists, and several of his works have set record prices at auctions. Here's a picture of Joan Mitchell in her studio in 1983. She is considered a second generation abstract expressionist. So here's another example of her work. Along with this. So you can see a lot of mark making and you can feel that kind of gesture that we talked about when considering abstract or abstract expressionist art. Now, Helen Frankenthaler also be an, um, was an abstract expressionist painter and she was a major contributor to the history of post-war American painting. Having exhibited her work for over six decades, she spanned several generations of abstract painters while continuing to produce a vital and ever-changing new work. I really love the layering here of all the colors, um, a really great sense of space on this piece. And here's another one of her works. So now that we've had a journey through art history of looking at so many different pieces, I hope that this gives you a better understanding of where abstract art has been and where it's headed. And with that, I want you to create a work of art today that um, takes into consideration the different art styles that you've seen and using oil pastels or mixed media or whatever you have um, on hand, I would really encourage you to use some random tools that you might have around the house. You know, what would it look like for you to um, paint with a fork, for example, instead of a paintbrush? Um, because that's so... Um, it's obviously limiting your uh, realism for sure, so you'll have to be more abstract by doing that. Um, so create an abstract work of art. Think about how to use the elements of art. Again, those are space, line, value, color, texture, form, and space. And I'm going to do a quick demo just to show you how I might would go about this. I would also encourage you to think about expression 
there's a lot going on in the world right now and art is a wonderful tool that we have that we can use to help express yourselves in a really healthy way. So I think that um, this could be a great opportunity for you to just make something that doesn't even have to be representational and you can just create. You can just use lines, mark making colors. If you feel like it doesn't look that great, <laughs> don't even worry about it. Just have fun and enjoy it. But do try to think of about the elements of art and composition as well. And just keep working on it. If it doesn't feel right at first, that's okay. The important thing is that you're just creating. So I'll be making a digital version of the art project today. So I'll be using kind of a variety of marks um, and variety of media that's, of course, digital. Um, but I would encourage you to really think outside the box when thinking about what tools to use and what kind of materials to incorporate into your work of art today. So I mentioned that I really like the abstract expressionists as well as Ensemble Kiefer. So I'm going to make a work of art that is sort of inspired or influenced by these artists. And so you can see I'm using a really wide brush here to make some large marks. I'm using pastels and different patterns and I'm just layering so much on top of each other. So it's not just one mark and then another mark right below it. Instead, I'm building up the surface of my digital paper, I guess, or our canvas, so that it has a lot of complex um, textures and patterns and a lot of mark making. Not a ton of color. You can see I'm pretty much limiting my color palette to mostly just some earth tones, a little bit of blue, of course, lots of black and white, but most importantly here, I am just adding lots of expressive marks so you can really pretty much see my hand through the process. Um, and I'm just kind of drawing what I feel. And so it's a little bit dark, I guess, but I think with everything going on in the world, that's sort of just um, fairly accurate, I guess. But um, I, I encourage you to... Um, really fuel how you're feeling into your art piece today and it doesn't have to be perfect it just the process let the process be more important than the product let the action of it be more important than the outcome <laughs> 